Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jason Scott. Jason is a U.S. Navy veteran, founder and CEO, speaker, author, instructor, and expert in transformational leadership. He is CEO of 120 VC, where he has spent over 20 years leading global transformation efforts for companies like DirecTV, Trader Joe's, Blizzard Entertainment, Riot Games, Sunny Picture, Pictures, and others. He is the author of It's Never Just Business, It's About People, and I'm excited to have him on the show to talk about the idea of transformational leadership. So Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, it's great to meet you. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have another Navy veteran on the on the program. And uh, so yeah, I thought I want to start off a little bit about that is what, you know, what did you do in the Navy? What was your experience in the Navy like? And I'm just kind of curious, how much of that experience in your life does it carry with you into what you do today at your company? It It's literally one of two things that it, that significantly influenced the trajectory of my life. If I had not joined the Navy, and by the way, my joining was reluctant, uh, I wouldn't, there's no possibility I'd be the human being that's sitting before you today. Like, you know, and it, it's funny you ask me, what what did I do in the Navy? It's more like, what didn't I do in the <laughs> Navy? You know, people tell people when they're joining the military, hey, don't volunteer for anything, but that's the best part about at least the Navy and I assume the other branches, they will let you do absolutely anything that you're willing to volunteer to do. And so the, the opportunity to learn and grow is infinite. And obviously the military is gonna challenge you, provide you with discipline. I mean, I, I was not a responsible human being before joining the military and the military showed me what responsibility like looked and felt like. Yeah, I, yeah, it's funny because I was giving a talk uh, two weeks ago and I mentioned something about the Navy and some people were asking me questions at the show. It was during the Q&A session and I mentioned something about the idea of one of the things I was doing was crawling inside nuclear weapons and checking the, checking all the connections before we went out to sea as a 24-year-old kid, you know. Who lets a 24-year-old kid inside a nuclear weapon, you know? It's, the amount of responsibility you get uh, at such a young age is is incredible. And uh, and I think you're right. The the sky's the limit with what you can do in the military if you, again, volunteer and willing to just you know, try something new. Yeah, for sure. And then work hard at it. Yeah. 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 It's really, really neat. Well, um, that's great. Now you, you've got a company called 120 VC. We mentioned it in the intro, but you've been doing it for more than 20 years. So tell us a little bit about the company and, and why other companies seek you out. What's your, what's your specialty? So we're in the business of helping organizations, leaders, and their teams get the outcomes that they need. Like we are, we, we started out 23 years ago as a project management company. Um, so we, you know, we, we, we were at, we were experts in that discipline, but that's, it's a tool. Then, you know, everybody's sort of agile and scrum, another discipline for driving change, organizational change management came on the scene, another discipline for helping drive change. And somewhere along the way, I figured out that leadership is also a discipline. It's not like something that you can wing. It's something that you have to work to master. That has a lot to do with understanding and empathizing with people and bringing people together. But it is a discipline. And last thing, nobody hires a leader anymore because they want their organization to be the same in a month, six months, or a year. Leaders take organizations and their teams on a journey. And so, I don't know, It's this was probably seven or eight years ago now, we realized that we were in the change business mm. and that and that we had we were good at something that the rest of the world struggled with um there's a book called five dysfunctions of a team i'm sure you're familiar with it the fifth dis the discipline or dysfunction is inattention to results and you know when i read this book fantastic book uh patrick Leoncini, and someday he's going to call me and say, dude, you've been pronouncing my name publicly <laughs> for 20 years incorrectly, but that's fine. Then I'd have it correct. Um, anyway, I, my mind was blown, but I knew it. And that's how I made a living. And so I realized, you know, look, we're good at this and helping people get the outcomes that they need, um, pulling teams together, getting them focused on, res on the results, on the outcomes, you know, changes their lives. People thrive on winning teams. People's quality of life is better on winning teams. Their financial prosperity is assured. And so we're really in the business of helping people get things done, helping teams get things done, helping organizations get the outcomes that they need efficiently and effectively. 
Um, and by the way, while recognizing the humanity of everybody on that team, our projects aren't like Game of Thrones, like most projects. <clears throat> and it's not because we do it differently in the sense that, you know, we plan them similarly, we define them similarly. We do quite a few things out of the traditional order. We think that the traditional approach is broken. We've proven that tra the traditional broke is, approach is broken. In fact, the statistics prove the traditional approach is broken, meaning that you can't talk about projects without hearing a disaster story, especially the large global yeah. ones. Um, and so, the, but the key to our success is when we talk about what's good for the company, we're talking about the humans, not the legal document that incorporates it, right? Like that's not the company. Like what's the company if it's not the people that have come together to uni unite around a mission and a purpose to create something of value? Right. So, you know, when we think about, hey, this project, it's good for the company, but if we don't know how it improves team member satisfaction and customer satisfaction and profitability and none of the three of those at the expense of each other, right? Like neither does anybody else. And there's no sense to actually try to unite people to get it done. So, you know, the trick for us is it's, it really is uniting people and asking them to help you solve a problem that they think they have, right? Because they're the company, not just the four or five or six executives at the top. I know I knew it was going to be a good interview <laughs> before we got started, but I mean, I just love to hear that because it, um, you know, uh, we were talking earlier in the show in my first book, I say leadership is a people business and it's, it really is. It's about taking people on a journey, as you mentioned, to, to a higher level in, in terms of their personal selves, pushing, helping people get, reach their full potential and helping a company reach its full potential. And then when you do that, everybody wins, right? And I think, like you said, it's not just for the four executives at the top, it's for everybody in the organization. And I think that's something that it's it's really good to hear that that's what your company focuses in on because we need more of that. You know, I mean, uh, we need more of the, 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 hum, the human side of business, the people-centric side of business, for sure. So much more. Yeah. So that's that's really why I want to get in get you on it is uh, when I was looking through your materials this idea of transformational leadership is one of the methods you use to help get stuff done. So can you explain to the audience what is transformational leadership? Okay, so leadership, right? Um, someone that unites people around a shared goal, right? Help and then helps them architect their own roadmap to a shared goal. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of definitions to leadership, but would you say that one resonates a little bit with you? Yeah. Okay. So first, a leader has to establish a shared goal. A, a shared goal can't be voluntold. Predominantly, this is what executives try to do. A shared goal can't be assigned. We literally are uniting people to solve a problem that they think they have. Then we have a shared goal. Second thing, servant leadership. You asked me about that too. Yeah. Um, it, th this is leadership in service of the team, right? Mm. They're not there to work really hard so I can look good, get my next promotion and my bonus, right? Like I'm not in charge, right? I have a responsibility to care for those in my charge. The idea is that when my team is successful, then I'm successful. The key performance indicator of a leader is that we enable our stakeholders, not just our team members, but all of our stakeholders to define and more importantly, deliver the needed results, all right? So I'm leading in service of my team. Where transformation then comes in, which means a thorough or dramatic change in form or appearance, I'm not just there to help people work, spin mm. in circles. I see so many marketing teams, they don't necessarily have a goal, they're marketing. It's gotta be beautiful, it's gotta mm -hmm. be wonderful. I see operations teams, they're working to maintain the status quo. The status quo is dead. It's about the yeah. status go. Again, nobody hires a leader because they want the organization to be the same in a month, six months, or a year. And I, I think the vast majority of people in management and leadership positions don't know that. They don't get that because they want their team to show up on time. They want their team to do their jobs perfectly and never make any mistakes, okay? And they want them to make sure, no matter what happens, that they, the manager, never looks bad. Mm, yeah. Here's the deal. You you're 
those people are terrified <laughs> in that in that environment. They are terrified because it is impossible to do your job and not make any mistakes, especially if they're asking you to change something. Mm. We all know how to be successful doing our jobs the way that we do our jobs. Now, we also know that optim organizations are optimized for the results that they're getting. The only way an organization is going to get different results is if the human beings in that organization go about performing their jobs differently. This is why we deploy the widgets, the ARP systems, the CRMs, right? Like we build the big campuses. It's so people can work differently and achieve different results. And here's the, here's the rub. I have, I have had the good fortune in my career of uncovering several universal truths and the first one is that fundamentally human beings want to be successful at home yeah. with their families, yep. with their friends and in their careers. And so, and so when we ask them, Hey, do, do your job differently. They're like, Oh, oh whoa. Uh, uh, I don't know how to be successful doing my job differently. And so often leaders are terrible at sharing a vision with them that solves a problem that they think that they have. So they're not even compelled. And lastly, we, we learn things, but to master something, we have to apply it. And the first phase of mastery is incompetence. Mm. <laughs> so, hey, I want you to practice doing your job differently. You're going to feel incompetent. Oh, by the way, but don't make any mistakes. These, this is why it's not that people don't want to change. They don't feel safe to change. And so a leader's job or a transformational leader's job is to recognize we're asking them to step out of their comfort zones. We're asking them to experiment. We think what we've presented will achieve the results that we want, but we don't know. It's an exp The whole thing is an experiment. All right. And so recognizing this and even sharing it with your team members, hey, guys, we're in this together. All right. We're going to we're going to figure it out. We're going to try some things. We're going to see what results we get, and we're going to continue to iterate. And it's going to be messy. It's going to stress you out. It's going to feel awkward, right? Because we're at the end, we're all trying to do something new, and none of us are sure. None of us are confident. We don't know how to be successful, but together we will figure it out. So that's mm -hmm. leadership to servant leadership to transformational leadership is really making people feel safe to experiment and going about their jobs differently. And the big picture is sharing a vision with them, a why that solves a problem that they think they have, not just that the executives think that they have, but that they think that they have. Because mm. in, in the end, the people that are gonna do the work and the people that are gonna have to adopt the new ways of work, working are the 80% of the people, if not the 90% of the people involved in the project. And so if you want the job done, they have to be committed and bought in the 10%, the executives and those people. Sure. I mean, they're important. What they think is important, but they're not going to win by trying to shove this down the throats of the people that have to do the work and adopt new ways of working. Right. And so they think, Hey, we can just be efficient. It's their job. We can just tell them to do it. I show me where that's working. Mm, yeah, it doesn't work it's not shit. working. So you're like, <laughs> yeah. so I, I come to organizations and I'm like, hey, we're going to take some time before we launch the project to build demand, to ask them, hey, what, you know, hey, we think we're thinking about running this project and we're thinking it solves this problem for you. Can you tell me about a time you had this problem and, you know, what you did to overcome it and gather feedback, create demand. They say, well, that's a lot. That's like a heavy lift. That's going to take a long time. I'm like, hey, you know what? You can be efficient with things. But when it comes to people, more often than not, the long way, the considering them way, the working with them way is usually the fastest way to get the outcome that you need. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I spent um, 22 years in corporate. So I, I ran eight different manufacturing business during that time. And so in the early part of my career, I was really the guy they sent in to do turnarounds. So I would turn around struggling manufacturing businesses. And so it was always a transformational process. But what I noticed was in, in corporate, and you mentioned this in what you were talking about, is there were so many, uh, you know, it's it actually as these, these companies became bigger and more mature, and, and we, we reached high, higher levels of performance, 
all the all of a sudden the managers show up and th this was the idea of like don't break it you know it, it's it's working fine you know it and it was this fear based uh everything has to be you know no we can't have any errors we can't have any mistakes we can't screw up and it was always like people fearing for their jobs and I always enjoyed the transformational process, the turning the businesses around, getting everybody aligned towards a common goal, right? That, that, that again, you know, seeking the people's input, you know, going on a journey. And that was really fun. But when I was in a role where I was like, don't break it, I hated it. I didn't like it because I don't think we like to be that way. You know, it's just- It's Game of Thrones. It's Game of Thrones, exactly. Yeah, it, it's all fear Instead of spending time doing your job, yeah. you're spending time protecting your job. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And just it, and everything you said, you were going in and you called it a turnaround, but really what you described it from my, where I was listening to you, you were going in and you were building teams. Yes. Yeah. You would pull them together as a team and teamwork makes the dream work, right? Like it's yeah, teamwork yeah. is a superpower. Yeah, it is. And so it's interesting because you know, I've always thought throughout my career that I was a servant leader. Like I, I put people first, I focus on their efforts. But then when I really dug in deep on transformational leadership, I realized that I'm probably more like that kind of a leader. And the reason being is um, I was always about trying to get the best opt the best performance out of the business and the people, you know. And so I always said that transformational leadership is the and. Whereas servant leadership is like, you know, people focused, people centric, which is critical. But I think transformation is it's it's the people and the mission. I think that that a transformational leader can do that. It, it's more it's, it has the and in there. I think that's probably the best way I figured it. It's well put. I like that. I'd not heard it that way before, but it's 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 a hundred percent. If you look at the old way, which is hey, the mission, who cares about the people? Right. 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 Yeah. Listen, if a company isn't achieving its mission, it's going to go out of business, and that's not good for anybody. Okay. Yeah. Then came servant leadership because, you know, it was the mission and who cares about the people and the people were beat up and they weren't getting good outcomes. So we had to right. rebrand servant leadership, right? Right. And it got, and it, it, it became about giving hugs, being nice, being cool. And that's all that mattered. And then stuff stopped getting done. And by the way, I made this mistake in my own business on that journey. I almost put us out of business, business like, because I took my eyes off the mission. I didn't know how to be like the nice guy. And also I didn't know how to do accountability different than when I learned it in the Navy, which is like mm -hmm. this for those people that are watching on YouTube, like I'm pointing my finger, right? Like right. It really shaming, you know, or dressing them down. And so, you know, when I first tried on my servant leader pants, I, I was just, I was like, if I'm just awesome to everybody, they'll thrive. And that's not the case. People need mission focus. Yes. So I like what you're saying. The transformational leadership is you take the playbook from the servant leaders, which is, hey, like, take care of your people, make this about the people, build the team, recognize and respect their humanity, and make sure that you keep the mission focused. And in the end, they thrive. Because yeah. on this team over here where I was just being cool, but we weren't getting the job done, because I wasn't keeping the mission focused, we were failing, and they were miserable. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, you know, bring it together, which is mission focus, and humanity focus, right? Like it's how you build thriving teams. Yeah. And the other thing too, is I think, you know, as, as I've worked with people, led people for more than 30 years now, is that people want to go on a journey. They want to be part of something big. They don't want to just come in, uh, you know, do their to-do list, answer some emails and go home every day and, and you know, and watch Netflix. I think they want to be part of something bigger. And when they are, it's something they talk to their families about. You know what we did today? We, we've never been able to do this, but we, we produce more you know, widgets in this factory than we've ever in the history of this plant. And we did it and we had fun doing it. And, and, you know, they, they, they want to be part of something bigger. And I think that, um, I think you're, you're right. And that's what energizes people and gets, gets them, you know, one of the things that we have a problem with is that people aren't engaged at work today. Right. So we have a big disengagement problem and it hasn't changed. It's been around for a long time and it hasn't gotten really much better, but I think it, part of it is, is that I'm not engaged because I'm not, in, I'm, it, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm working on something that's meaningful or, or I really bought into a goal. Can we unpack this a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I remember, you know, reading the article on employee engagement, you know, the Gallup yeah. study, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Year, years back. And I was like, okay. And I got it. And I didn't know the picture I had in my head of what it looked like. It turns out wasn't what engagement looked like. And I, I really think 
the vast majority of managers and executives don't understand what engagement looks like. So can I, can I tell a quick story and ask you a couple Absolutely. of questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I want you to think about the very last time you had a great idea that you'd been thinking about for a while. And I ask this question to large groups all the time. Let's see how this plays out with you. I, I might not get the answer that I'm hoping for with you because you are obviously an expert in leadership and engagement. So uh, work with me here. So you've got this great idea. You've been thinking about it for a little while and you're like, okay, now it's time for me to pull together the people that I think can help me make this thing a reality, right? So you're gonna pull together the team and you start pitching and they start asking you questions like, well, why do you think that's a good idea? Well, why would you do that, right? Like what, I mean, what, what, where did you come up with this? As if you experienced this situation? Yes, yeah. And yeah, how, does it, it, how yeah. does it, how does it, how does it feel? Like just one word emotion, like how does that feel? How? Like, it's like, why don't you get, it's not, that's not one word, but like, you know, like get on board. Like maybe, like, why don't like you maybe you're a little frustrated. You're frustrated. Yeah, you're like, yeah. why are they questioning me? Why don't they get yeah. it, right? But here's, Here's the beauty. I want to help you shift that perspective. And by the way, I've walked a mile in these shoes. I'm like, I remember early in my career when they started doing that to me in my mind, I was like, Oof. and by the way, young Jay was not a good leader. <laughs> young Jay was terrible. In fact, yeah. my name is Jay Scott and I'm a recovering bad boss, right? <laughs> like I ended up, I'm so, I got saved somehow by realizing, you know, that working with the people is much more fulfilling anyway so i'm just I, I remember god why don't you guys get it like i'm literally the smartest person in the room and i'd be yeah. frustrated right here's the shift that's what engagement looks like they're yeah. trying to understand what shift that when somebody that comes to you with an idea that you you care about a little bit how do you understand the idea? How do you connect with the idea? We start by asking questions. Well, why? Why do you want to do this? Well, why would you do it that way? Here's the thing. If somebody's asking you, why would you do it that way? It's because they care yeah. about the outcome and they care about you. Here's the most hysterical thing that I've learned. And sadly, I'm 50 and I only learned this in the last couple of years. <laughs> When you pull together that team and you pitch them the idea, if they all just kind of nod their heads and pat you on the back and say, that's a good idea, Jay, you know what they're doing? They're blowing me off. Yes. They're trying to get rid of me because they're yeah. busy. In yeah. a sales conversation, if they start giving me compliments, I know they're trying to get rid of me. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. But if they're asking me critical questions, if they're digging in, what, what do, they're interested right? They're trying to solve a problem. They're, they're trying to figure out how what I'm proposing can help them. I have engagement. So sadly, I think the vast majority of managers feel like they're being challenged and they shut it down because it feels bad and it's hard. And, and what they're doing is they're actually shutting down the engagement that they're so desperate to get because yes. they don't, they think the engagement is Oh, that's a good idea. You're the smartest person in the yeah. room. Yeah. Right. When really engagement is you've got them engaged in critical thinking in a brainstorming session. And they're not, they, they need to challenge you. They have to ask questions. If they're asking questions, they're trying to become your co owner. They're trying to become your partner. They're trying to figure out how they can contribute. And if we understand that, then it feels good and it doesn't feel like they're tearing you down and we can foster and promote engagement. I love that. I love that. I really hadn't thought of it that way, but I do, I've also, you know, I've often said this in, in, in some of my writings is that, you know, a complainer, right. And a lot of times is someone who cares and they want to see something changed. You know, there are people that are just negative, but I think I've all in my career, I've taken the time to listen to people who are complaining and why they're complaining. But again, it's a, it is engagement. Right. The people who are not engaged, are like, oh, I just hate this place. I'm just going to go home, you know. Right. Because uh, there's a likelihood that nobody else is listening to them and you're the fresh ear. Yes. That's right. It. And, and, and they got blown off. And so they're yeah. frustrated and they're complaining. Yeah. And so if you listen to them and I'm with you, some people are just complainers. Right. But right. some people that care, they share it, they get blown off. And then, so the way that they deliver it, maybe the next time the fresh tears sounds like right, they're complaining. Right. Yeah, exactly. But the reason they won't shut up about it is because they care. Yeah, they I care. love that. Yeah, I yeah. love that. So, yeah. so sometimes complainers actually are, they're, they're, they're important to your business. You need to listen. Yeah. 
Yeah. So well, there's a listen. All feedback is good feedback. Mm. You know, even if they're just complainers, they're still telling you how they feel and what's going on in their heads, and that's a gift. We can't lead people if we don't know what's going on in their heads. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So your your latest book is called uh, "It's Never Just Business; It's About People." So um, tell us a little bit about why you wrote this particular book and why you put a focus on people. Because, because I think the the model of management that most people are familiar with is broken. Mm. Um, I think it's about them. I think a lot of managers think that they need to be the smartest person in the room. They behave like they have to tell their teams how to do their jobs because that's the only way that they can be successful. And I think that there's one, it's it's a behavior that they've seen. I think two, the vast majority of us operate on the illusion of control, meaning that we have any, okay? And that if we, being because we're smart enough to have become the manager, and if we relinquish control to these team members, mm, I can't trust that they'll play for me. Mm. And I need them to play for me because if they aren't successful, I fail and therefore I'm going to apply control, except for that's unmotivating. Mm. It's demotivating. And if you don't trust your team members, they're not going to trust you. All right. And, and more importantly, I ask these people, and again, I don't think that they're toxic. I think they just don't know any better and they've got this, they have success and they don't want to lose it. People don't, nobody wants to go backwards. Again, we all want to feel successful. And I, I don't think that they know another way. Now, I do also think that there's other people, we call them Antoines, which is based on the uh, entrepreneur in the Free Guy movie with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Um, he owns the company called uh, Tsunami, right? So he's a video game entrepreneur. He built a game. Anyway, he's hilarious. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's hilarious. So uh, there are these uh, narcissistic leaders that do believe that it's all about them and everybody's there to work hard so they can be successful. And so I feel like these are the two motivations, like one being fear and not knowing another way and the other. And I, I really honestly feel like it's less, uh, it's less common. Uh, the person that really is just playing for themselves. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we are wired to play for self first. And there's the shift because leaders, leadership isn't about me. It's not playing for me. It's not about making a lot of money. It's not about being successful. It's, a, it's about helping my team members be successful. When they're successful, I've then been a successful leader. And more importantly, when and there's a, we all have worked for somebody that we knew thought we needed to work hard so they could be successful. And I know this because I, I've, I've had audiences four, five, 600 people. And I'll ask, I'll say, Hey, remember the time you worked for that person that, you know, wanted you to be perfect, that literally like, you know, made you feel like you were there to work hard so they could get their bonus and be successful. Like, how did you feel about them? Yeah. I mean, John, how did you feel about that person? One word. Of oh, yeah, yeah. Out. yeah, no, it's the, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, you, you just don't care. You know, you're just, you know, at, after a while, you're like, oh, that, I, I don't get anything out of this. Only they do. All you right. Know. So that's a very, that's of the responses that I get, the one word emotions that I get, that one's very kind. Yeah. Right. But nothing ever positive. Right. And then yeah. I asked them to think about a time where they worked for that person that they felt like was there for them. And that person mm -hmm. could give them the most critical feedback. And they were like, thank you, because yeah. they believe yeah. that that person was giving it to them to help them. And it's always like, people will say words like love. Mm. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like friendship, uh, you know, fulfilled, right? Like it's always positive. And so the leaders that understand that it's not about them that show up to help their team and team members architect their own rap roadmap to a shared goal, their team feels that you're playing for them. And so here's what happens. They choose to think about your success when navigating their success. Whereas when you're the boss and they don't feel like you care about them, they don't care about you. They're happy to let you watch, walk off the end of the proverbial pier. And so that's, I think that's the difference. And I, I just, and I think it's also the dominant model, like what I call the boss. Right. Um, and I just, I just think there's not a lot of people out there. There's well, there's a lot, but not enough 
There's not a, a, a large enough percentage of folks like you and I that believe what you and I believe about leadership in front of the masses. Um, for one, the message to really get out there that there's another way, there's a better way. Like, it, not only will you be more successful, but you'll love it. Like, mm. you feel better. Yeah, like, yeah. it's so much better to play for your team and have them play for you back. Um, and then, really, in honesty, there's quite a few people that hear the message, might resonate with the message, but don't know how to get there. And they don't have anybody to help them, right? Like, it's really hard to de develop new habits. As I'd said earlier, new, like if what they're doing is working for them, even if they're miserable, trying something new is a risk. And people, you know, oftentimes need the situation to get bad enough to be willing to take that risk. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, it's 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 interesting because what what you're saying is, and I think, and this is something I've experienced through my career, is that people, um, you know, leaders are looking for the solution to be able to to to, to make make their organization successful, but they also want to control everything. And what they realize, what they don't realize is, is there is no control, but if you, if you actually let go, you're likely to be more successful. And if you try to hold things tight and, and controlled, and I think, you know, my experience, I experienced some of those things. I, uh, my businesses were always very successful compared to my peers. And there was a lot of, in some cases, jealousy is like, oh, you're the golden child. I kept, kept being called the golden child. And they're like, and then they would say, well, you know, what is your method? What are you doing? What are your tricks? It was like, I, I have no tricks. I literally have <laughs> engaged people towards a common goal. And, and, and that's my, that's my answer. And they're like, what do you mean? How, do, how does that work? It was like, they were struggling to understand the idea of letting go. And actually that's where you get much more, uh, when you get people engaged, excited, um, they're on a mission, they're on a journey with you, then you're going to do these great things. And it's not about control. It's just the opposite, actually. And I think that uh, many of my peers struggled to understand what I was doing. It was like, it was too, I don't know, maybe it was too complex. It, it was a simple idea, but I think it was too simple. So they thought, well, that's, that's got to be another secret, you know? So the idea is simple. And in fact, the techniques are simple, but very few people are teaching them. And so mm -hmm. in our playbook, there's maybe somewhere between 15 to 20 literal techniques. I, I once were, I had a, a leadership coach. I'm a, I'm, I have the great fortune to be a graduate of the Stegan Leadership Academy out of Dallas, Texas. And my coach through that year long program, his name was Paul. Um, and one of the things that he used to talk about were these great leadership books with these great ideas, but they don't tell you how to do anything. Mm. Okay. And, and so I, I think, you know, like I'm a huge Simon Sinek fan. I'm sure that you probably are too. I'm a huge Brene Brown fan, right? Like there's a lot of really great information out there. And even you and I, we're having a great conversation that is going to inspire a lot of people to say, I want to be that kind of leader. I want to have that kind of leader. But unfortunately, in 30 minutes, we're not really able to give them, tell them yeah. how to do it. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, I have a 14 week leadership program and it takes 14 weeks to just scratch the surface yeah. on how to do it, but it can be done and it can be learned. And I think that that's also the frustration, right? The more of us out there, like giving a, and it really is people say, Hey, great leaders are born. They're not made. No, there literally are like active listening is one of the best yeah. leadership techniques that exists. Now, I don't have time on your show to explain it, but to your audience, if you do anything after listening to this, if you were at all inspired, Google active listening. There's literally <laughs> five steps. Google Stegen Leadership Academy active listening. Google 120 VC active listening. Uh, somewhere in the 120 VC active listening, you'll get the steps. You'll find a how to, right? Active listening is absolutely hands down one of the most powerful leadership tools to helping people architect their own roadmap to a shared goal and getting all of the buzzwords accomplished alignment buy-in clarity right uh, like you know leverage the collective iq setting them up for success like it does all of those things more importantly it makes you and those that you are leading also a team right so it also fosters teamwork so that's that's, you know, if I've done anything today, hopefully I'm getting the word out on active listening. 
you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna end it right there because I was gonna ask you what your final message, but that's a good final message right there. Look up right on listening. That's a great way to wrap up this discussion. Uh, this has been fantastic. So I was gonna uh, I was gonna say, uh, Jason, uh, how can people find out more about you, what you do with your company, and uh, in the new book, the latest book you have out? Um, so you know, obviously you can learn about 120VC by going to 120VC.com. I do spend uh, the large majority of my time speaking. So that I have a speaker website, jasonscottleadership.com. Um, and then, you know, it, I, I love to link in with, uh, link in with like-minded people. Um, like, you know, I, I loved learning about you. I love being on the show. I love the, the, all the discussion that we had even before your show. Um, and so if anybody loves your show and they reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, Hey, I heard you on the show. I know they're my people. I'll accept, I'll <laughs> yeah. accept the invite and I'm happy to then answer questions that they've got, like connect with them. Um, I love helping people improve their leadership skills because leaders make the world go round. Leaders make the world a better place for people. That is such a powerful message. <laughs> I couldn't say I couldn't have said it better myself. That's fantastic. Well, again, uh, leaders, um, again, I really highly encourage you to check out uh, the resources we talked about. We'll put links and show notes for everything from Jason. But uh, again, I think if you're looking to try to understand how to be a great leader, as 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 Jason mentioned, it's not an easy process. It takes time to learn it. I often say that uh, learning leadership is a you know maybe you can learn it in a month, but it takes a lifetime to master. So it's a constant learning process. And uh, again, resources. Uh, Jason has plenty of resources is to help learn how to become a better leader, how to be that transformational leader. So Jason, I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing this. I think I think you've given us a lot to think about. Um, and uh, I really like your approach to leadership. Maybe we share a lot of the same ideas. And that's probably why I like it. But uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing uh, this idea of transformational leadership and some things that we can think about as leaders to be more, uh, to get our teams more involved in what we're trying to do. Right on. John, thank you so much. Two my five, man. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.